All right, Greg, the bye week, and it sounded like from everything I was hearing out of Lincoln this week, actually people were looking at it as a positive thing rather than a negative thing this late in the year, guys getting healthy and also getting a chance to focus on really spoiling Iowa season and also finishing off strong for the Huskers. Well, uh, you know, I, I think your initial reaction when you hit that bye week is, well, let's keep going. We've got some momentum going here. We've won a couple of games. But, but this team, the coaches – they needed a mental break, I think, as much as a physical break, just to kind of relax, take a couple of deep breaths, and then reset a little bit. That And the coaches utilized part of the week off to go do some recruiting, which it's going to be a, a real pivotal thing for the staff the next 60 days to get out and recruit. So I think there were a lot of positives that came from the bye week. And, and now this team's got to re- regenerate some of that uh, focus and play that they had uh, to end the Michigan State game and also the, the way they played at Rutgers two weeks ago. And, of course, regardless of what the record is, regardless of anything, it's always a bittersweet day on senior day and another great senior class graduating this year. 18 seniors, nine of them are from the state of Nebraska, so nine homegrown products. And, and I was going through notes the other day, Jeff, and of the 18, 16 have had an impact on this football team. That's a really good ratio. Mm, yeah. Usually you have, out of 18, you got four or five guys you've never heard of and never stepped foot on the field. But 16 of the 18 had, had a role in this football team this year. And that's a, that's a pretty good indicator this has been a successful class. And, you know, when, when you go through a coaching change, the hardest group it, that it affects is the seniors mm-hmm. because they've been in the program the longest and it were recruited by the previous staff. And there's still obviously other kids on this team that were recruited by the other staff. But, you know, through three, some cases, four years of being on campus, they'd been under the previous regime and they have to change for your final year. can be a difficult transition, but – a lot of the underclassmen, even the coaches this week, have been quick to praise this group for buying in and rallying the troops and keeping this team together. And I think there's a lot to that. When when this team was sitting there at 3-6 and six after the Purdue loss a few weeks ago, it would have been pretty easy just to mail it in. And yet this team has rallied to win their last two and put themselves in a position to get a bull bid if they can knock off Iowa on Friday. Well, let's talk about the Heroes game against the Hawkeyes. The home field advantage has been really no advantage in this series the last few years. You know, that's exactly right. I mean, this will be the fifth matchup between the two since Nebraska joined the Big Ten. The Huskers have not lost over Kinnick, and Iowa has split the two games that they've been over here at Memorial Stadium. And, boy, I still vividly remember the scene in my head uh, two years ago when the Hawkeyes upset the Huskers and racing across the field to pick up the trophy. And you're like, wow, this this does mean something. And, And now the stakes are even higher because of where Iowa and the tremendous season that they've had and winning the West Division and still very much alive in the national playoff picture. There's so much at stake for this game, and it's going to add a lot of juice to this one on Friday. And you know, The fans have been buzzing all week long, and it's just really odd to, to step back and go, man, Nebraska is in the role of the spoiler? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how to take that in some ways. Part of me is like, okay, I guess that's what we're at, but it also kind of makes me a little mad that Nebraska's <laughs> having to play the role of the spoiler in this game, but kudos to Iowa. They've, they've earned everything and all the plaudits that they've received over the last month or so. They've, they've had a tremendous football season. They've already clinched the Big Ten West, and now you've seen their name creep into the Final Four discussion. Do you think at this point the Hawkeyes are worthy of one of those top four spots? I do. I mean, I think when you've gone to this point in time and you're undefeated and people can say, well, you didn't play a great schedule. Well, they played two Power Five teams in the non-conference, Pitt and Iowa State. They've won at Iowa State. They've won at Wisconsin. They've won at Northwestern. So they have beaten some quality teams, and it, it's just so difficult to, to run the table. And, you know, if they're able to come into Lincoln and, and beat the Huskers, boy, I, I think there's no doubt you have to have them in that, that Final Four discussion. Now, there's going to be a lot of twists and turns still to come, and we saw those last weekend, certainly with Michigan State knocking off Ohio State. But there's more upsets to come. I think Notre Dame's going to have a tough week this week. I think you know, the, the Big 12 schools still have some major battles that they've got to, to fight. So it, there's twists and turns. But as of right now, as we sit here, if it ended right now, there's no doubt in my mind I would be in that Final Four. Their defensive numbers are gaudy. 19 points per game is all they allow. They've forced 21 turnovers, including 13 interceptions. And Desmond King has eight of those, 27 sacks for this group. Nate Meyer with six and a half. I mean, they're getting it done a lot of ways on defense. You know, I think Desmond King's got a chance to be the player of the year, defensive player of the year in the Big Ten. I mean, you, you have those kind of numbers and his ability to affect this game and the kicking game. And, and when you have a lockdown corner like that, it, it just changes the whole makeup of your football team. And, 
you, know, you talked about the turnover margin. There, there's no secret. You start looking into the numbers, you see why this team's 11 and 0, plus 11 in the turnover margin. The, the Hawkeyes very rarely make mistakes. Beathard has given them life on the offense. But when you're turning the other team over and you're making big plays defensively and they don't give up big plays, that's the mm-hmm. other thing. They've just, well, we've talked all fall about how the Huskers have given up big plays. Very few has this Iowa defense given up. They make you work it down the field and try to get it in, in there for some points. And Nebraska will have to be patient at times on Friday because Iowa just does not give up much deep. And there's two aspects to turnovers. Number one, you got to force them. Number two, got to take advantage of them. And Iowa's done that about a touchdown per game, 76 points in 11 games off of turnovers. Yeah, you're making me jealous here because <laughs> that, that's exactly the winning formula. Yeah. And they have dialed it up this year. And uh, credit to Kirk Ferentz and that staff because – when you when you don't make mistakes, the other team does, and then you pounce on it, it just can be so demoralizing for the opponent. And Nebraska's going to have to fight that. Even in the Rutgers game, the Oscars had those three interceptions. Now, it didn't burn them much against the, the Scarlet Knights, but if they have those kind of turnovers in this one against the Hawkeyes, it could really term, determine the game. So Nebraska's got to really take care of the football. And again, I, I stress patience with the cold temperatures in this game and the way Iowa plays. Nebraska's got to be patient. Nebraska's got to be okay at times just to say, maybe we'll be just better punt here if we're facing third and 11 and not try to force something. Let's just maybe run something safe and simple, get a couple yards and punt the ball away and play some field position. Because I was certainly content doing that. But the minute you try to force something against this defense, they seem to come up with big plays. You mentioned C.J. Beathard. It all starts with him on offense. He only had one start last year, and you're always curious to see how a guy is going to evolve into that starting role when he gets it full-time. And, boy, 61% completion rate, 205 yards a game, 13 touchdowns and just three picks. Just amazing what the change at that position can do because you can see the guy that, that he beat out, Jake Rudox, done pretty, pretty well at Michigan mm-hmm. this year. But C.J. is just, I think, giving them some added life. He's got a little bit different skill set than Rudox. He's not, I wouldn't say that he's a running quarterback, but he can hurt you. He, he, he picks his spots when to run with the football. And you may have everything perfectly covered downfield, but he's a good enough athlete that, athlete that he can get out of the pocket, scramble, and if you need six yards, he gets you eight. If you need five yards, he gets you seven and keeps the drive alive. Just a very heady kid, and he's also one that has not made mistakes this year. And so uh, I, I'm not sure what the Iowa coaching staff saw or didn't see a year ago to not play him, but for the, 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 the toughness to make the decision to go to him has paid off big time for the Hawks. Jordan Kanzari, just a shy of 100 yards a game. He scored 10 touchdowns on the ground this year. And you, you saw him last year against the Huskers, 55 yards on 16 carries. What kind of runner is he? Pretty good. He was having a tremendous season, rolled an ankle in their Northwestern game back in mid-October. They've got great depth at that spot. They've got Daniels who can also get in there and run. Um, Wadley came into that game at, at Northwestern when when Kanziri rolled his ankle and Wadley ended up being the Big Ten Offensive Player of the Week as he rushed for nearly two bills in that game against the Cats. So it's it's much more than Kanziri. They've got some really nice depth at that tailback spot. And if you think about Hawkeye football over the last couple of years, it seemed like their best running threat was big old Mark Wiseman, the big guy who was really more of a fullback than a tailback. But Kanziri, Daniels, Wadley, those guys all have a little bit of movement to them, and they can they can just plump it down the field much better than what they've been able to get out of that position the last few years. So Nebraska's going to have to try to contain, I don't think you can stop, but try to contain that running game if they hope to get the upset on Friday. So if Nebraska wins, two huge wins down the stretch, and obviously that sixth win making the bowl eligible, but if they don't win, Greg, and finish 5-7, and seven, Ordinarily, you'd say, well, they have no shot at going to a bowl game. But then you look down and you say, okay, well, the Big Ten, actually, if Iowa then is in that top three, the Big Ten would have a shortage of teams to qualify for bowl games. So could a five-win Nebraska team still get a bowl game? Yeah, it's a numbers game right now. Nationally, there are 40 bowls. Yeah, that's right, 40 bowls. <laughs> way, way too many, but that's what we have. So 80 bowl slots right now. As we get ready to hit the last week of the regular season for most teams in the country, there are 71 bowl eligible teams, so nine spots short. There are 14 teams, including Nebraska, that need one more win to become bowl eligible. It's going to depend on how all those games play out this weekend, and there's a couple of teams that will play the first Saturday in December to see if there's enough bowl eligible teams to fill all the slots. If there are not, the NCAA is not quite announcing what their determination is going to be on how they fill them. But one of the things could be, does each conference fulfill their 
required bowls. And the Big Ten, as you mentioned, is not. So that would maybe lean to a 5-7 and seven Nebraska team uh, maybe getting an extra look. So there can be some scoreboard watching on Saturday <laughs> if the Huskers don't win Friday. But as Mike Riley said, Let's just win the game and not worry about all that. It's in our control to go get that six win. Let's get it done. Does this feel like the kind of game, Greg, where all the pressure's on the Hawkeyes? I mean, they've got all of these lofty things they're playing for and, and, and historic things in terms of making the, the, that playoff for the first time ever and all that. And Nebraska just trying to finish out with a win. Do you think that the, the pressure really is on the Hawkeyes in this one? There's no doubt. I, well, I was doing Kansas State football back in 1998, and the, the Wildcats were undefeated going to their final game of the regular season, and they traveled on the road to the Missouri Tigers, one of their longtime rivals. And and, and Kansas State survived and, and got through it and finished off a, a perfect regular season, but it was a dogfight, and there was no doubt. You could sense the pressure even on the flight to Columbia, Missouri with the K-State football team that day, knowing that they're trying to protect what's just been an unbelievable season. So, yes, there is pressure. That would behoove Nebraska then to get the early jump in this game, get on top of Iowa and really make them start to play a little bit out of their comfort zone. So I don't think there's any question. The pressure is on the Hawkeyes, um, and the Huskers kind of have a good feel about them right now. There's a little looseness to this team that wasn't there a month ago, and unfortunately we're not playing for a whole lot. I mean, yeah, yeah, bowl game, but, but yeah, I think there's no, no question. The pressure in this one is on the shoulders of, of the undefeated Hawkeyes.